Welcome to another episode of the Rubber League Outsiders Set of Six, our weekly news show where we share the good, the great and the noteworthy of Rubber League outside the Heartlands. My name's Craig. My name's Carl, and obviously this week we'll be giving a grand final review and we'll also be talking about the international fixtures that are coming up. Wales, Jamaica, England, Samoa. It's all to play for. Right, another busy week in the world of Rugby League. Now, right at the end of the show, we're going to talk about the England Samoa. We're going to give our little uh, players to watch and that kind of stuff. So make sure you watch all the way through to uh, to catch that. So let's get straight into the first story, the first tackle this week. And the only place that we can start is with the, uh, the grand final from the weekend. Yeah, and I think... Uh well, we could talk about the game. I suppose we should view the the match day experience is the way to put it. We went as uh, as fans essentially, didn't we? We enjoyed the atmosphere. Great day out. It really felt like a great final to me. I know the game probably isn't going to go down as a classic, uh, but yeah, I fully enjoyed the day out. Yeah, it seems like a weird score, doesn't it? Nine points to two. That just doesn't yeah, seem like yeah, a rugby yeah. league score. But um, but yeah, I mean, great rugby despite the weather. I mean, there was one point where there was just this rattling started on the roof and like, what the hell's that? And then all of a sudden the biggest <laughs> yeah, bloody hailstones yeah. just started dropping. Um, but played continued. So it was a little bit chilly at times, but all in all, a great atmosphere. Yeah, I think you've got to uh, take that into account now whenever you in a grand final you got uh, all four seasons in, in one day <laughs> <laughs> during the game, yeah. Uh, if we're talking about the game, OK, I played incredibly well, I thought. Um, they, they didn't suffer from nerves. I think that was the, the talking point. One, uh, are Wigan going to blow them away? Are Hulk are going to get stage fright on the big stage? They didn't, did they? Um, Hulk are really took that game to Wigan, especially in that first half, I thought. Well, you've only got to look at how close the scores were, you know, and fundamentally there was just, there was, there was one major difference, wasn't there? And that was Bevan French. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And with this solo try, it was just, you know, incredible. But I actually thought, when I was watching the game unfold, and I, you know, you, you, you try and take into account like how much pressure is being built. It seemed to me like Hulkar were building the more, the yeah, most yeah, yeah. pressure. It, it seems like they were turning the sets around in, in better areas than, than, than Wigan were. They seemed to be dominant in, in attack. Like, you know, quick play of the ball and, and that kind of thing. And and I genuinely thought Hull Car was really in with a chance because they, they just seemed to be building more pressure yeah, than Wigan. Yeah, that first 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes as well. I mean, it, it was, yeah, Hull Car really had that territory advantage, didn't they? I thought Mikey Lewis's kicking game was was on point. He was pinning Jai Field right back down in, in their own 10. Contrast that with Wigan's closing sets I think uh, Harry Smith was rushed a few times on the last tackle and they didn't quite get the, the kicks away that, w that they wanted to uh, yeah so it, it was really close and it but and then we just had this this absolute moment of brilliance didn't we by Bevan French and it just completely changed the game I thought yeah it was incredible solo effort another talking point was the junior in Semba incident where it was Basically cleaned out on the pitch, wasn't he? And then, and yeah, then somehow yeah. was allowed to, yeah, to yeah. re-enter I thought this was interesting. It looked like it was knocked out to me. And uh, I was of the opinion, if you got knocked out these days, your your game was finished. Um, there was a bit of a late hit as well by Joe Burgess. It didn't really get... He got shown on camera literally once. And I, I don't know if that contributed to it or not. Like it's, it, like say, it, was, it flicked off on the camera literally once and they, they didn't show it again. Yeah, so interesting that he did come back on. He did, he did have a big part to play in that second half. If you were going to go to the moment of the game, what would you give as your moment of the match? I think the moment of the game was literally Bevan French breaking through because, you know, it was so tight. Yeah. And uh, and I think it was probably two. There was, that was the moment when I thought, mm, we're going to run the ascendancy now. Hulkar haven't been able to penetrate their defensive line yet, so it, it's a little bit unlikely that they're going to do. And then I also thought there was, there was a series of like incidents, like three like spilled balls by Hull KR. Yeah, in the second back, half. In the second half. And I just thought, this ain't going to go Hull KR's way. No, you know? it, it, they got to that point. They were, they were starting to force it a little bit, weren't they? And, it, you know, they were, they were chasing the game at that point. Once they started forcing it, that's when you, you could sort of see Wigan were you know, taking control. I think my moment of the game was a bit, bit of an odd one, but I think 
when Harry Smith slotted a drop goal over just before half time. Yeah, literally down seconds and, and it, of his first half. And it completely changed the dynamic of the second half because Hulk Howard were chasing two scores at that point. Uh, so yeah, just that one point extra going into half time, I thought really changed the game. If they'd have only been the six points behind, I think Hull Car may have played a different game in the second half. But I think yeah, they started to force it, and, and inevitably uh, Wigan were with the victors. A couple of things we need to shout out. Um, thank you to uh, <laughs> to Luke who actually got us to the game. We was on the trams like two like drunken idiots trying to find our way and, and Luke <laughs> yeah. and his family were like right come with us got him, got us under the his wing and got us to the ground so thanks a lot for doing that uh, and also Dave who we met in the ground who sat quite close to us in, in the ground come over and, and had a chat and it was uh, it was great to get a bit of feedback in person really and um, and here you know he, he said that he tunes in every week watches the show every week and had some uh, good stuff to say it was great to get that because yep. you know sometimes you feel like this is a bit of a bit of a one-dimensional thing where we're just chatting to a camera and we don't don't always get the best of comments. And uh, so it was nice just to get a little bit of uh, positive feedback. What did you take from it? Luke was awesome. We, we were literally head, just headed. We were just following the Wigan fans, weren't we? And it yeah. was like, no, you, you're going the wrong way, following Wigan fans. <laughs> They're all going the wrong way. Get on this tram. Yeah, so yeah, Luke, awesome, mate. Nice to speak to you as well. Going to move on from the grand final. Oh, by the way, just one little uh, finishing thing. So obviously 68, nearly 70,000, was it? Yeah, nearly, yeah. nearly 70,000 there in, in the stadium brilliant and it's weird to see that the crowds this year the trend has been that they're on their up and that's that's uh, that can only be good for the sport okay so let's move on then so from the Super League Grand Final all the way across the channel to France now yeah so we spoke to Liam Duffy who is a coaching consultant uh, in Elite 1 and Elite 2 in France although the, the league has actually had a rebrand but we'll get into that anyway here's the call but best place to start is you know how did you end up in the south of France and how did you get involved Involved in coaching, and well, I think uh, I, I, I was living in London around like COVID times and stuff like that. And as you know, there's not a huge amount of rugby league in London. And then just after the back of lockdowns, um, I was just playing like amateur rugby league in London. Um, although, like, like for a few of the teams there, it's, a, it's actually quite a good level for all the all people kind of look down on London rugby league. Once you once you like I said, look at the top few teams. I, who I who is in involved? So, so, sorry, who was involved with in London? Because we've we've covered quite a few sides in London this year. Yeah, uh, at the time I was I was playing for Chargers, so they're in Southwest London. So yeah, I would say it's a bit of a tri nations. There's them. They're kind of mostly Brits um, with a smattering of um, Aussies and Kiwis. Like there are a lot of like guys who came down from up north or students who like discovered rugby league at uni who make up the charges. Then you've got Hammersmith, who are mainly Australians. Yeah. Then you've got West Warriors, who are mainly Kiwis. So it's a bit of a bit of a tri-nation. But once you get those three teams in the mix, like it's, you know, it's, it can be a really good level and a bit of a rivalry. Um, so yeah, I was involved with them uh, and actually suffered uh, a concussion making a tackle, which, you know, before that, I thought that concussions were, you know, you just had a bit of a headache for a couple of days, but the, the symptoms lasted a long time. Yeah. Um, it's what's known as like post-concussion syndrome. So I just kind of like got, it got further and further away from being able, being able to play uh, and like the season's matching up, as you know, over there, um, the season's in the summer. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll be able to play like, time my comeback for the French rugby league season which starts in September and you know I'd, after COVID and stuff like I just decided that I wanted to I was kind of done with London so um, but I also wanted to get back involved in rugby league so my choice was move back up north or move to the south of France when the south of France seemed a little bit more appealing to me I'm sure you can understand <laughs> yeah um, so so I went for that um, yeah just contacted a few different clubs and said look you know I'm not asking for anything I'm injured at the moment but you know I'll help coach whoever you need like kids you know uh, first team, whatever. Second team, I don't care. Like, I'll just come and come and coach, and when I'm ready to play, I'll I'll play. And I'll, you know, I'll, I was honest with them. I said I'm not a superstar, but I'll make as many tackles as I can in a match, and that's what you'll get out of me. So yeah, a couple of clubs came back, and I settled on on one. Came over to coach with them, uh, and then yeah, since then started an initiative that was focused on like tackle technique and contact skills, tackle university, and I do I do coaching. Um, I did I did get back playing, um, but kind of left that behind now and just focusing on the coaching so I'm coaching with a few different clubs doing a bit of strength and conditioning but also kind of really specialising in on tackle technique and contact skills what, what are some of the things about French rugby league that someone you know in the UK wouldn't be aware of I think that people would be quite surprised by the level not necessarily not necessarily in terms of 
you know, there's quite a few players knocking about who played like Super League, NRL in, in the top French division or Queensland Cup, New South Wales Cup. Um, you know, I think a comp like New South Wales Cup or Queensland Cup is going to be probably like a bit faster and more technical. But French Rugby League can be really physical. And I think that's where that's where it has its edge. Um, and I think people are kind of surprised by that. And, and you know, this is not meant to be a negative point and, or, or a knock on it, but... You know, there are, it's a kind of a bit old school. There are still some scraps in, in games, you know, it's not uncommon. Whereas, you know, when you get to the professional levels in Australia, particularly, like that's more or less been elimin- eliminated from the game. Yeah. So it can get a little, it can get a little bit tasty. Um, and, you know, there's guys who, who, you know, don't take a step back. And I think, I think, you know, in, in England, uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if this sounds a bit silly, but you kind of have a perception of French people as, you know, like, uh, as one thing, but then you know the rugby league towns are, are something else entirely. You know these are these are tough, rough people who you know, like I said, you know, if someone's in their face, they're not going to take a step backwards. Mm. Um, and you know the kind of towns they're from are kind of semi-rural or industrial themselves. So it's kind of like I'm sure, like we're not going to go the history of French rugby league uh, through the 20th century, but it's a bit of an ugly history. So the places it survived are these kind of, you know, no nonsense towns where people have had to really fight to keep it alive. Um, and that's kind of, that's very much in the DNA of the sport over here. So looking at the, the league so far, we've three games in, aren't we, in Elite One? How, yeah. How's the season yeah. unfolded so far? Yeah, it's a bit, um, so look, like uh, you alluded to, there's been a bit of a rebrand. So it was Elite One and now it's like Super Trez, Super 13. Um, I'll be honest, I think I preferred Elite One, but we'll, we'll leave, we'll part that one. Um <laughs> So you've got a few teams that are, I mean, the finalists last year, Carcassonne and Albi, um, are going to be strong again. Um, Limu are always strong. Santa Stev, which is Catalan Dragons reserve. They, yeah. I mean, I guess from from their point of view, uh, I'm sure they won't mind me saying this, but they're more of a, more of a like develop the talent kind of project to feed into a Super League squad than they are necessarily about winning the trophies in elite one whereas you know a lot of the other elite one teams they are elite one teams and that's it yeah um so but having said that it looks like the early signs from santa stev catalan dragons reserve this year is that they're going to be really competitive as well um not that they haven't been competitive but i think it's they've had more of an emphasis on bringing youth players through rather than like assembling the strongest squad possible um but they look like they're going to be really you know a real a real kind of show of force this season and they've got um, I don't know if you caught it they've got that rugby union convert Lamb who came over from Montpellier I believe it was who's who's playing for them so he's played you know top level rugby union and is now playing in elite one super trez competition so um, yeah they should be a force to be Forced to be reckoned with. You mentioned uh, you know a player there just sort of switching union to league and, and, and does that happen as often as it as it might do in the lower leagues in, in the UK in France, or is it so, is it a, an abnormality really? Uh, it does happen. What I say is like a lot, and this is going back to your question about what would surprise people about rugby league. Even though rugby league is obviously doesn't have the footprint of rugby union, the towns that have like an elite one team or even an elite two teams, a lot of those towns really are rugby league towns. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of weird. Like one of the towns where I lived is you know postcard France like it's really lovely you know beautiful place tourists come to it in the summer and have their photos taken in front of all the old buildings and stuff like that but you know you'll be walking down the street and see people wearing like a St. Ellen's jersey or Penrith Panthers jersey mm. um, which is just like really unusual and especially after living in London for a few years you know you would never see never see something like that um, so I think like there is a bit of crossover um, but you know, like I said, they're you know the, uh, the the players that make up the elite one teams are league players, and they have always been league players, from what I can tell. Um, you know, the towns that they've grown they've grown up in, in like a, what they call an Ecole de Rugby, a rugby school from a very young age, uh, and been all the way through the system up to up to adults. So um, yeah, they're they're not that, not that crossing of the codes doesn't happen, but there is almost a kind of distinction between the league towns and the union towns in some parts of France. It sounds like a really high quality competition. I'd, I'd, I'm interested to, to to get a bit of an understanding why uh, rugby league in France at national level hasn't really hasn't really hit the heights it should do. Have you any ideas? Uh, I mean, well, we can get into the socioeconomic reasons which probably hold rugby league back in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so much, so much of it is historical. I'm sure you've touched on this on your podcast, but with the banning of rugby league during the second world war under Vichy um, and the kind of seizing of all of its assets, seizing all of its bank accounts and that never coming back to the game. 
I mean, the places that rugby league exists now are, are in many cases the same places that rugby league was restarted after Vichy fell and after the Second World War. So um, it hasn't escaped that footprint very much. Um, and that is, you know, because of those historic reasons, because of those socioeconomic reasons. Um, that said, it definitely is growing. And I think um, the impact of Catalan Dragons in Super League is, um, you know, is is having an effect, and I think, you know, as ever with these things, you you were never going to see the results in the first five or even ten years of Catalan Dragons' existence. You know, this is you know growing a sport like rugby league is a multi generational project, um, especially like with the advent of new technologies and rugby league is competing against more and more sports and more and more distractions, especially for young people. You know, it's going to be a multi generational project, but we are starting to see, you know, people, especially especially with the Dragons being in the grand final Super League, you know that turned a few heads and people started saying, oh, hang on, what's this? Um, what's this sport that's going on over here? Uh, and, you know, people discover, discovering it on YouTube and saying, wow, this is, you know, this is an exciting sport. And I think from what I've seen, going back to your previous question about union players coming over to league, at the lower levels, you are seeing that a bit more. And, and you ask people why they fancy giving league a dig. And one of the most common answers is, you know, they came across it on YouTube and they might have been alienated by, you know, some of the tackle law changes in rugby union, which, which, you know, some of the players that really enjoyed the physicality and really enjoyed the contact are now, uh, from this is just my impression, are now quite frustrated with rugby union yeah. uh, and are coming over to league to kind of get that back into their game and, you know, re- rediscover the bits that they enjoyed. Um, and I think, you know, in both the UK and France, there is a kind of begrudging respect among rugby union cohorts for, for the intensity of league. And the physical demands of it, you know, like nobody shies away from the fact that league players run a lot more, they make a lot more tackles in a game. And, you know, it's it's just tougher on the lungs and tougher on the legs. And I think people know that. So, you know, it does appeal to those people to who that appeals. Um, but like I said, it, it I think it's historical reasons that it is a bit more limited. Um, but that is, we are starting to see a bit more of a buzz um, because of the Dragons and for that brief period that Toulouse were in Super League. Um, I'd like to see them back in Super League with a bit more... Um, a bit more time to prepare their squads and a bit more infrastructure behind them, uh, and I'm sure we'll start to, you know, they'll start to be even a bit more momentum. Yeah, what, what's the what would a match day experience look like at this level in France? Uh, very, it can get pretty tasty. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, not the not the biggest crowds, um, you know, and that's that's often a reflection of the areas that it's in. So it is the places that it survived after after rugby league was banned are in these kind of quite small and often semi rural towns. Um, so while it might not be a big crowd, it might actually be quite a big percentage of the local town's population, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you'll get, you know, they, they've got decent facilities. Like most teams will have, you know, good a good complex to play on with a, you know, good intact field and a good, at least one big stand. And um, some of them stand on every side. Um, and, you know, the, although it might not be the biggest crowd, there will be a good atmosphere. And like I said, because the comp is quite tasty on the field, um, you know, it can it can get a little tasty off the field as well, and I don't mean that there's any trouble in the crowds or yeah. anything, but I mean yeah. that you know, it get you kind of get this little cauldron atmosphere, even though there's not an enormous crowd, and you know, people, you know, especially when you get young players playing and their mates come from school and they're treating it like it's an Olympic Marseille match, and they're they're almost coming with like flares and you know stuff like that. <laughs> it's, it's 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 quite a cool atmosphere, um, but yeah, I guess you know, like I'm sure you've seen when you watch Catalan Dragons yeah. game. Uh, a home game like there's there's so much pressure on the ref and uh, you know they'll appeal every decision and shout for every offside and every potential high tackle you know it's, it's kind of similar to that so um, yeah not the biggest crowds but uh, a good atmosphere Liam it's it's been ace talking to you about uh, French Rugby League mate I've, it's uh been insightful for me um, it's something we want to learn more about even more confirmation of just how tasty French rugby league can get um, yeah so we've had a few people now who sort of ex- ex- describe the match day experience in France and uh, it looks it seems like it's a bit old school but it, that's it, it sounds like it's Workington v Barrow on steroids <laughs> yeah, it does. doesn't it <laughs> yeah it does. but it yeah does. sounds interesting yeah yeah and you never know what I love about this is the fact that People get to travel through sport. You know what I mean? It's, it's just another example of Liam over there. I think, I think he went out on a bit of a lame and thought, right, I'm going to go and get over there and do something, stay in the game. And uh, and he's out there, south of France, living the dream now. Yeah, great connection from London to the south of France as well. And 
people tell you rugby league doesn't exist outside of Yorkshire, Lancashire, well, they're very much wrong, are they? It does. Moving on then. So from French rugby league, we're going to look at wheelchair rugby league now. So Leeds Rhinos completed a perfect season, defeating Halifax Panthers this week in the grand final. The final score was 52 points to 32. We were hoping to get there. Unfortunately, we couldn't get there. But I did watch the game on TV and it was an absolute cracker, Craig. I don't know what you thought about it. Yeah, it was it was a cracker. And what I loved about it is my, my wife sat and sort of watched a little bit of it as well. And she was, well, it's not the same as rugby league, is it? And I was like, well, watch. And then it was like straight away, like Wayne Boardman just absolutely cleaned out, uh, you know, one, yeah. one of the Leeds players. And it was, she was like, God, they do bloody at each other, don't they? And, and then and she got drawn in. And I think this is the amazing thing with wheelchair rugby league. You just get drawn into watching you know, just because of the, the different collisions, the skill, pace of it, the fact it's a smaller pitch, I think it's a little bit easier for people to get their head round because of the way that, you know, it is played. I mean, if we actually look at the game and in a bit of detail, I thought Rob Hawkins was absolutely... On inf- fire. He was influential for Halifax in that first the first half. And the way he moves and tilts his hips as he's going forward, uh, the Leeds defence really struggled to handle him in that first half. I, I loved watching him play. I thought it was so exciting. I think it, it took Leeds a while to get into their groove, I think. They, they kept chipping away and kept themselves close. Uh, but yeah, Rob Hawkins, he was absolutely brilliant that first half. As was Jeremy Bousson, who just... Oh my God, you know, yeah. yeah. They, I mean, it must be like Man, man Mountain, big speed... It, power his <laughs> limbs are just seem to be twice as long as anybody else's he, he made a break in that second half it was like I don't know if it was an interception or the ball went to ground or something and he made a break in that second half I was like I, I didn't know someone could move that fast <laughs> on a wheelchair like it was like a rocket going down that wing one of the Leeds players did nearly catch him actually Tom Halliwell yeah yeah, Tom Halliwell wasn't it yeah but oh my god that he was fast down that down that wing yeah such an exciting first half 22 points to 16 to Halifax at half time and I, I, I felt like Halifax were going to start pulling away in that second half but second half came and, and, it, and it all changed really yeah um, I thought Leeds just kind of dominated that second half and just went about the business really really well for me it was it was great to see some of the players that we spent time with when England were preparing for the French match last in their club setting that was that was that was great to see I don't know if I want to talk about the negative really but I just thought the the, the location could have been could have been a bit better, yeah, a bit more I'll, accessible I'll, for I'll, people. I'll go on to that in a minute. I, I thought Nathan Collins was absolutely instrumental. He, he's so slight, isn't he? And he's so quick. I'm um, going, especially when he starts, like, just it makes a little inroads just around the rook and, and then sometimes attacks out wide. He was dangerous. And then we got to talk about Josh Butler, the current wheels of steel. It was, it was, I, I kind of felt like it was like Rob Hawkins, Josh Butler. That was like the side story that was sort of developing within the game and, and Josh Butler came away with a hat trick. Um, I'm sure we're going to see him playing for England this year. Yeah, I'd I'm like, sure we will. I think the majority of players on that. Do you know who else I thought had an absolute quality game? Wayne Borden. Yeah. And you, you could sort of say maybe Wayne's getting towards the end of his England career because he's, you know, he's England number one in, in England heritage number one. He's played for that England side for a long time. Um, but he, he controlled the game so well and his kicking game I thought was brilliant. The, the accuracy he put on with the, the chips into the corner and the grubber kicks through. Um, yeah, I thought he had a great game. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned the, the location, Cal. Yeah, I just felt like the whole occasion could have been bigger. Uh, it's, it's for my like, yeah, it maybe should have been somewhere else. Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, we didn't go because we couldn't get there and and back to the Midlands, could we, we in time for getting my daughter to school and stuff like that um, for the next morning. Um, yeah, I think if it had been a bit more sort of central, like your Manchester sort of area, you may have got more people involved. And I just, you know, I felt like it was just undersold a little bit um, from what we've seen before. It'd have been nice for electronic sponsor boards to be up around the pitch. And I don't know. Um, I, I always feel the lighting should be dimmed a little bit as well. Just yeah, make, yeah, you know, you know, like when you go, when you, when you watch like netball on TV or um, basket, British basketball now, it's, it's, it's lit differently as you know, they, they use a lot of neon strip lighting and um, like just the lights. Just, just the lighting d- effects. Yeah. yeah I, I just, I just felt like it could have been, Done on a slightly higher standard. I know they've got the the, the proper pitch now, uh, which is great to see because you can see the proper markings on the pitch. So, yeah, it felt like a a level up from a a normal wheelchair match, but 
I, f- I feel like the, we can we can do more. I'm sure we can do more. Because I, I think wheelchair rugby league should be standalone sport. I'd love to see it on TV every week, I would. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with all of that. Uh, right, okay, we're going to move on then. So uh, tackle number four now and uh, Wales, Jamaica. This yeah. is quite an interesting um, prospect. Yeah, great to see Wales and Jamaica both playing international rugby again. That's the first place we should start, wouldn't it? Um, Wales have got a crucial game coming up in a few weeks' time where they'll be in a semi-final against, is it Serbia they're playing? Serbia. Yeah, playing against Serbia for a play. Well, that'll be the semi final, um, and they'll play the winner of France Ukraine. Uh, so obviously, they're going for the World Cup qualifier. So, it'll be the next, the last, one of the last teams into the World Cup. Uh, so, yeah, the, it's great to see this game taking place, taking place in the south of Wales. So, the, the squads have been announced. I'll bring them up on your screen at the minute. Uh, yeah, so there's a it's a, it's a mix of Championship League One players. Um, there's even a few community players mixed in there. I think there's seven players on debut for the in the Welsh squad. So I'll, I'll go through it. A couple of people, uh, Sam Bowery, uh, Midlands Hurricanes, he'll be on debut. Uh, there is a few sort of big names there. Gil Dudson, um, ex Wigan, Salford, Warrington, you know, ex Super League player. Be exciting to see him play. We've also got Ben Evans, ex sort of Bradford Bulls, North Wales Crusaders player, Elliot Kia, another big one. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a good mix for Wales. Um, not much Super League talent on there, but yeah, it's it's a strong it's a strong mix of League One and um, Championship players. So you got Joe Coop, Franklin. Billy Walkley and Finn Yates, uh, they're all from like the Wales National Academy who will all be on debut. So that's great to see that the the the, the systems that they've put in place at national level are now bringing players through. And on to the Jamaican squad then. One I will point out, Joshua hudson Let he's a community player with Bedford Tigers, plays on the wing, really exciting prospect at the minute. Um, I spoke to his coach, he's had a great season. Uh, so it's great to see that he's been rewarded uh, with a place in the Jamaican side. A couple of players there from uh, Siddle, Keenan Ramsden from Siddle, and then Alex Young from Sydney Roosters, who is the... Is the brother of Dom Young, so England international Dom Young, England international Dom Young, yeah. So he he went over to the the, the Roosters, I think it was earlier on in the year. Yeah. So looking at the looking at the two squads, Craig, what do you, what do you think? What are your initial thoughts? I know we don't know every sort of player on that on those two squads, but uh, you know what are your initial thoughts? Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns, and um, but let's let's have a look at what we do know. So we, we know that Wales are going to be hungry to get their first win on in South Wales for what seven years or something it's, since they've played it's been an awful long time yeah, yeah. so uh, Jamaica have, they always come with a point to prove you know really do you don't get much more outside the heartland side Jamaica without doubt the best kit in rugby league yeah uh, and, 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 and in there there is some very well tried and tested players with a lot of skill and experience yeah um, so you know they're going to be a formidable formidable opponents and um, but I just think there's a little bit more experience when you look at like Reese Williams Gil Dudson um, yeah. you know Elliot, it, it, Elliot Kier the block, yeah. you know so there's a lot of lot of skill in there so I would like I would think that Wales are your favourites but Jamaica can definitely bring an upset um, we're going to try and get to the game tomorrow night, so we'll uh, maybe do a bit of pitch side reporting. Just uh, keep an eye out on the channel there, just in case that uh, that lands tomorrow. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, looking at the squads, I think Wales, you would say favourite. I mean, they are pushing for a World Cup place, aren't they? So um, John Key has got to get this right. Um, but it, I, I, I like the fact that we've got some sort of community players on the fringes of these squads. Um, yeah, and obviously. It's great experience for League One and Championship players as well. But yes, it's exciting. Yeah, I suppose what we need to do is a bit of a shout out. If you are in South Wales tomorrow, Neath, is it? Neath, yeah. Uh, 7.30 kickoff. If you're kicking around and you can get there, please get there and support these lads, support the game. Because after all, we, we want the game to grow and this is a big part of it. So, um, all right, we're going to move on from the Wales-Jamaica game to England-Samoa now. Yeah, so the, the, the squad's essentially been, uh, I know we've got a full Samoa squad and then the England squad's to be whittled down. We haven't actually seen the final England squad yet. Um 
Well, just talking about this game, how excited are you for this match? Because I, I can't wait. I honestly can't wait for this. Well, we're gonna, we could potentially end up with a lot of egg on our face. That, there is a super strong side that, uh, that Samoa have, have announced and with, with skill and pace and power to burn, some absolute sizable units in the middle. I, I'm, I'm looking at that and comparing it to the England squad and I'm like, we're not going to dominate in the middle. You know, no. we need strength, we need speed and power on on the flanks, and 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 I think we've got personalities that to do that. But absolutely, we could, we could, we could. Well, yeah, we got. I mean, years ago, right? You'd England v Samoa, you just sort of go right. England are favourites, yeah, whatever. But you have got so many players jumping ship now. You know, from Australia, New Zealand to Samoa. <sighs> Jumping ship? I don't think that's probably the right way I'd put it. Well, I think it is, they, they sailed in the Australia <laughs> ship or the New Zealand ship, and then and now it's like that. Samoa's getting stronger, right? We, we want to put some more effort into the Pacific Islanders, you know, whether we get close to roots or wherever it is, but for whatever reason, they're now going, you know what, you, you guys crack on, and I'm, I'm going well, <laughs> to... Well, a, a lot of them. these players are absolutely representing the... Uh, Birthplace, is it? No, not, that, that's what I'm saying. But they, you know, they they have represented it's, other. Yeah, other it's nations. because Australia all the, always had the monopoly over yeah. the because it was like the the, the dangle the carrot is like you got to play state of origin, and everybody wanted to play state of origin. If you played state of origin, then you got a chance to be picked for Australia. Now a lot of players are turning the back on on state of origin, and they want to play for the you know the Pacific the, Nations. Pacific yeah. Nations, yeah. It's a, I, I I love it, and but. Samoa have got even stronger since they made that World Cup final appearance last time. And like you say, we could end up with egg on our faces here because we've been, the, the, the RFL have built this, haven't they? As yeah, yeah. It's time to get revenge yeah, sort it's of redemption, thing. isn't it? Yeah, redemption. And it could, yeah, it could end up being a, could end up going 2-0 the other way, I think. I don't think Samoa will ever forget that 60 point to six loss in the World Cup. But they'll never forget it. Like and no, it's just going to go no. down as like almost like a battle, a battle honor. You know what I mean? Where I just constantly need to get redemption from that, because um, that must have stung massively. You know. Um, all right, they got their own back later on in the tournament. Oh, did you know, they ever, did they? Yeah. You know, but um, I don't think they'll ever. They'll, they'll never let that happen again. I'm, I'm pretty sure. No, so I'll bring in the uh, yeah, I'll bring the Samoa squad up on screen at the minute. I mean, just <laughs> just <laughs> the players that are in this team. It's um, I take any one of them in Lee's Rhinos right now. <laughs> <laughs> any one of them. Um, so you've picked out a player to watch, Craig. Who's your player to watch? Well, I've picked one from I've picked one from uh, Samoa, one from one from. Um, England. So, we, what are we doing? Going for both? Uh, well, go with your play to watch with Samoa. First. Right, Samoa. I, Jerome Luai, right? Yeah, obviously. Just, yeah. you know, magic. And and when I was looking at this, okay, right, where's the stories amongst these teams? Now, if Michael Lewis gets picked, right, we know that Michael Lewis can be a little bit petulant at times. Now, Jerome Luai is skillful enough, fast enough, you know what I mean? It, it, and he's got the temperament to get under Michael Lewis's yeah, skin, proper, rattle him, proper get him wind up the pitch. Merchant, yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Just an absolute massive character, but has got, uh, you know, an arrogant, let's face it, all right? So, but can back it up. And, and I just think he will get under Michael Lewis's skin and... <laughs> Michael, who's got to be careful, like he's got to rein it in. He really has. Yeah. So my one to watch is uh, Roger Tuivasa Sheikh, who yeah. is just absolute quality box office dynamite. Yeah. He's as yeah. fast as they come. He's built like a mountain. Uh, it's. Uh, he's made the switch from New Zealand, which is interesting to play. He's got 20 caps for New Zealand, so he's now making the, the, the trip over. So his last international appearance, funnily enough, was actually on the other side, on the other court, uh, playing rugby union for the All Blacks in 2022. But, you know, the, he's, he's, a, he's another sunny bill, isn't he? He's, the, he's just got skills in yeah. all departments. We'd be interested to see where he plays, whether he's, he's in the centres or at full-back. Um, but he's going to be hard for England to handle. Yeah, it's definitely exciting uh, for England then. I, I was looking at the England and I was trying to pick out like a player to watch and I was a little bit lost with this um, purely because we don't we don't know the starting lineup yet, do we? No. Um, and, and one of the things, like I said, I don't think we're going to be compete particularly well in the forwards uh, when you look at like John Asiata and how he's tore up the bloody Super League this this year and, you know, some of the other players there. So I'm thinking, right, we, it, it could boil down now to the fringes. Okay, so I was looking at that. Okay, who's going to be the starting wingers? 
And that's quite hard to work out, really. It, at the minute, it is, yeah. It really yeah. is. You know, you look at like Liam Marshall, Matty Ashton, that both had incredible seasons, both prolific point scorers. And, and let's let's face it, that's what we need to be able to win. And then you look at like Dom Young, you know, who's tried and tested in international colours. I don't know who's going to be what. But so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do like an all-encompassing thing and say the wingers for England are going to be key. And whoever is picked, they've got to do a job. Right. Therefore, they're, they're, that's the area of the game. Maybe Hooker is is similar. That's the area of the game that is going to be imperative f- for me. I'm going the other way. I'm going right. forwards. Are you? I I think this, they've got a front up. Yeah, that Samoan pack is absolutely massive. Um, and I, I'm not 100 percent sure with England what uh, England's strongest uh, forward pack is. Uh, what I do know is Luke Thompson. He's a bit of an old stager now. He's he's been around the block a bit. I think he was so played so well in the grand final. I think if he really gets a drive on forward, both these sides need a good forward pack to, for a platform to play off. And I think if, if England's forwards can front up against Samoa, we stand a chance. And I think Luke Thompson, if he plays like he did in the grand final at the weekend, yeah, solid. gives us a chance. I mean, yeah, it was solid. I think you said to me earlier, if it keeps finding his hands and knees, that's, that's exactly what we need. But yeah, so exciting this game. So exciting. Do you think there's... A- like uh, any benefit of having maybe a slightly smaller, potentially more mobile pack? Or do you think that's nullified by the sheer aggression, size and strength of the of the Samoan pack? I, I think, again, that depends with what sort of... I mean, we don't know what half-pack combination no, no, Sean There's, Wayne's going to pick. So, yeah. I mean, George Williams, yeah. It, it, we need quick ball. George Williams likes to attack the line. Mikey Lewis likes to attack the line. If he goes with that sort of combination, yeah, maybe a more agile, quicker pack may play into England's favour. But like I say, it, it, it could go down the other route and he may be wanting to play a more structured mm. style of play. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Hey, it's going to be uh, definitely interesting watching that. So the first test is going to be the uh, the uh, Brick Community Stadium on the 27th of October. And then the second test is 2nd of November at Headingley, um, which good. both games that we're, we're, we're desperate to get to. Good choices for grounds, what would you say? Oh, I think it's a good choice. One in Lancashire, one in Centre of Yorkshire. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, both big stadiums, and of course, you know, start off, warm it up in Lancashire, and then the big finish, big, 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 big finish in, in Yorkshire. You know, it is. <laughs> okay, moving on from there, then. So the Williams Weekly this week, and this is a topic that I've seen sort of banded around on social media a little bit, and it's something that I just want to talk to you about today, Cal. Yeah, get, your, get your opinion on this, yeah. right? So, all right. So it, obviously, we can see the dominance of Wigan right now, right? Yeah. So they've won the quadruple first team for a long time to get six trophies back to back they're just absolutely dominant is the word my question is or the question that's been banded around is like how long is this team going to be dominant for like you know you think about like you know some of the long term uh, signings that Wigan have made well, Matt what, Pete yeah. seven years this year yeah. Bevan French Jai Field Junior and Semba all six year deals you know as well as that Matt Pete 40 year old right 40 year old yeah I think it was something I saw a stat that was like 60% of the team are under 24. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, One yeah. player is moving on this year. How long are they going to be dominant for and what do other teams need to do to break this dominance? Well, you've just said it, haven't you? With all the contracts and the extensions that they're putting people on six-year deals and there's a reason because the players they've managed to capture are absolutely quality players. So I, I genuinely think this Wigan side is going to dominate for quite a number of years. And what do other sides need to do? Well, they, they need to make some bloody big signings, don't they? Um, the, the model that Wigan have, have had for a number of years, they've really invested in their youth and academy systems, aren't they? And it's paying rewards now. They're bringing new players into the squad who are just... Well, like Junior and Semba, he's, he's box office, isn't he? First, you know, first big season. If they keep doing that and then they keep adding these brilliant players that they keep finding, like your Jai Fields and your Bevan French, I, I just, I don't, I don't know how other clubs are going to compete with that in the minute. And I suppose other clubs have got to replicate what, um, what we're going to have done. St. Helens did it for years. Um, but yeah, I've, the short answer is, I think Wigan are going to dominate for a, a large period now. Yeah, and I think I think it's, it's not just the playing group either. I mean, you look at the, the owner, billionaire owner, 
You know what I mean? So if we're saying we've got to replicate what we're going to do, we need to attract more billionaire owners <laughs> to rub the league. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and how do you do that? Like, yeah. you know, how, how do you do that? Chris Radlinski as well. He's also been pipped as like, you know, a huge part of the success. Incredible at managing people and, and working like a, a an elite culture within a team. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, and he's respected across the board. He's, he's like, um, I think he needs his own podcast. He's like Diary of a CEO rugby league. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. He's, how he's gone about his business with with a with a Wigan club since he it kind of all started. Well, it didn't no because Wigan's have always been a big club, haven't they? But he he's had such a massive impact on Wigan since he. He became part of the uh, the board there. Right, so I'm not going to let you get away with just saying oh, they've got to replicate what we're going to do. In all oh, right, oh, so mean. so imagine you know Salford esque. Take take what we've got, all right, and how do we compete with that team against that team? Saint Ellen's will be back, won't they? Because Saints have got that foundation, like Wigan have got, where they've got s- such an elite academy of players coming. I know they didn't quite hit the heights this year, but. The Saints have got the money to spend on big signings if if they need to. They've got the um, academy, like I said, they've got the elite academy. So Saints will be back there. Right. I think we'll see, in the next couple of years, we'll see Saints competing again. Whether or not they can match this Wigan side is, yeah, it remains to be seen. I mean, you, you should really should be saying, well, Leeds Rhinos, they've got all the money. They've got the, they've got the massive fan base. Their academy, though, feels feels like it's falling short a little bit. Yeah, well, there's no. It is. It's falling short. They they've not brought the players through the system uh, like Wigan and Saint Allen's have over the last couple of years. So you know, if you're looking at blueprint, I think that's the first place you got to start. You got to look at your academy. Well, yeah, and you've also got to wonder, like you know, we, we talked about Chris Radlinski, and what about Gary Evington? Because he just seemed to, from the outside, and we don't know negative culture. Well, it, it just he it, it seems to play games with people's contract, and you look at like Blake Austin, who was who was. Like one of the outstanding yeah, that, performers, yeah, right? and he, he, he was a player they needed to build around. Yeah, and and, and it, he didn't know whether he was coming and going. From what we was read in the in the media and that kind of thing, like he didn't really know. And then end up he just went right, sorry, I'll, I'll I'll go then. And you can't play those games, you know. And you you look at what we're gonna have done. And I remember having a conversation with Wigan a couple of weeks, well, a couple of months ago. And, you know, this this Wigan fat, staunch Wigan fan said, look, they are tying people into long-term contracts. And that is like nailing your colours to the mast. So you can't be having playing all these games and all this kind of stuff. So I, I think that is part of the problem with what Leeds is, is what's happening at Leeds right now. Hopefully Brad Arthur's going to stamp that out. You know, mm. he's a very, very experienced coach. We can see, if you've seen the trailer for the Spirit of the Rhino video that's coming, like he's absolutely no nonsense and, and won't take any of that crap. So, although he has just signed Jake Connor, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's happening there. Um, yeah, so personally, I think if we could put a, like a, an age on it, like how long is this Wigan side going to dominate for? It well, could be five years, couldn't well, it? Well, we know that the Wigan are going to be classed as the best side in the world for at least another 12 months because there's going to be no World Club Challenge because Penrith have bottled that, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> they bottled it. Shit the fans. <laughs> um, yeah. And on the flip side, Matty Pete is, is mega keen to play it. You say if it's happening, we're 100% you know, keen to, to play in that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen though, is it? No, it's not going to happen. It, it, well, what a shame that is though. I mean, honestly, like, if you look at Wigan and you look at Penrith Panthers, how good those two sides are at the minute. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. we, we should we should be going back to Old Trafford and selling Old Trafford out. Like, why wouldn't fans want to watch that? Like, well, they do want to watch it, don't they? But um, fucking make it happen, man. The, the, it, here's another to make thing. It happen. When we're talking about like attracting more money to the sport and stuff like that, well, this, this Vegas go. game, there this Vegas game could be huge, couldn't it? Well, it will be, yeah. Because you know you're going to go. You know who knows who's going to be in that crowd watching the likes of Warrington play and like you know what bit more money this could be spectacular throughout the world so but just because that's happening doesn't mean we should be axing the world club challenge no that's not the, well no it is it's not going to happen well that's not I know it's not going to happen that, but that's not why it's been axed does it they just can't come to practical arrangements to make it happen well they should make it happen well the world club challenge this year Wigan and Penrith would be absolutely massive and I don't know a rugby league fan in the UK who wouldn't go want to watch that. Mm. And you, you should, we should be, someone needs to make it happen. And don't just go for the Brit Community Stadium, 
Go for a big venue. Just go for it. And I, I genuinely think we could get a, a massive crowd for that fixture. Yeah, well, I completely agree. Okay, so that's been the Williams Weekly. Hope you can uh, join in the discussion in the comments down below. Until the next video, take care.